Hello and welcome to the program today. I'm Layo Olari Day. We begin in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where presidential candidates and representatives from various civil society organizations are calling for the annulment of the December 20th elections. At a press conference in Kinshasa, the coordinator of the Filimbi Citizens Movement, Mino Bopomi, read out a joint statement which partly reads the December 20, 2023 elections must be cancelled in a view of the serious irregularities. The controversy surrounding the alleged irregularities also come after Mr. Bopomi accused the country's independent National Electoral Commission of intentionally extending voting days and that's in violation of electoral law he is of the argument that the extended voting period particularly during the night might be exploited to manipulate ballot boxes in favor of a specific presidential candidate in a joint statement the opposition leaders and reps of civil society organizations described the elections as a sham expressing their intent and commitment to state protest despite the government's prohibition. Meanwhile, several people have been wounded as riot police forcibly dispersed a banned protest by the opposition who are calling for a rerun of last week's chaotic national elections. And while the disputed vote threatens to further destabilize the uh, Congo, which is already grappling with a security crisis in the East that has hampered development in the world's top producer of cobalt and other industrial minerals and metals. Police surrounded the headquarters of Martin Fayulu. He is one of the five presidential candidates uh, who had called on his supporters to march in Kinshasa on Wednesday against the presidential and legislative polls. All the supporters are saying the election was fraudulent and should be annulled. For more discussions on this, we're being joined now by Reverend Father Jean Ngoyi, who is speaking from Kinshasa. Uh, hello, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thank you, Mary. Hello from Kinshasa. Hello to Nigeria. Well, firstly, before we dive into the elections, give us an update on the situation of the DRC landslide. We understand that four people were killed in South Kivu. Yeah, unfortunately, Mary, the situation of the landslide in the Democratic Republic of Congo has become now a recurring issue, especially in the provinces where mining is widespread. The Southern Cable, that's where you find a lot of gold and a lot of coltan. But at, at the same time, you have also a lot of forests. So what happens is that uh, there is first uh, deforestation, and following the deforestation, you have mining going on. And when you add the uh, uh, illegal mining to the deforestation, and then the situation of conflict and war, that means there is a complete illegality. People are operating, extracting mines without any control. And so uh, the, the experts have really no time to make sure that they follow it, technically giving advice. What you are seeing there, there were some miners who were operating in a river, and there was a heavy a torrential rainfall. They ran into a small building that was beside the place, and with the heavy rains, the, the torrent carried away that little house, carrying with it about 20 people, four were dead uh, they were able to get uh, three, three of them saved but those who disappeared have not been found just yesterday and the day before yesterday there was another landslide this time around in the capital city itself of Bukavu and in another capital city of another province Kananga in the central uh, part of the Congo so they, 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 there is a great responsibility and challenge here for the regions where mining takes place, they need to control the mining, but also to ensure that the deforestation is stopped. That's a big challenge to the government and the Minister of Environment. 
Well, you've uh, just uh, talked Mary. about my next question, you know, about 20 people that are reported missing. You know, you said that they have not been found, unfortunately. Uh, but I want to understand, you know, how the DR Congo is. Are landslides, you know, a thing in the country? How, how frequent do, does this uh, disaster happen? You know, Mary, in the southern part of the Kivu, it is mountainous. That's the region that has sharing border with Rwanda and Burundi. Any one of you might have visited Rwanda. You know, that's a mountainous region. And so, when you add to that, the uh, constructions without any control, and there is no proper monitoring, people are building where they are not supposed to build. And so, if you, you, you are building where the rainwater is supposed to, to flow, you are putting yourself at risk. Government has been sounding warnings upon warnings upon warnings. Now, it's not just a matter of sounding warnings. It's a matter of putting in place effective measures to restrict people from building there. And, and so the, 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 the Congo, you know, very Nigeria is 926,000 square kilometers. DRC is 2.5. 345,000 square kilometers. So you have to take Nigeria twice and a half to enter the Congo. So showing you how difficult it is sometimes to manage this country because it's so huge. But at the same time, the government has to take its responsibility. All right, uh, Reverend Father, apologies, but you're speaking to a uh, liar here in Lagos. Mary is also one of the producers on the team. But let's continue and move on to, you know, the election that we are waiting for its results. President Felix Shisekedi, according to Seni, says that, you know, he's, he's in the lead. Uh, but tell us, is there any clear result now? Well, uh, Mary... This is something very funny I, I found when I came down to Kinshasa. I saw billboards. I saw huge posters. But I, 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 I was baffled not to see the, the pictures of other candidates. Almost all the people who are postulating for the National Assembly or for the Provincial or State Assembly, they heard that they, they, in their own background, President Shisekedi. As if in order to be elected, people needed to, to be seen with President Sekedi. And so the opposition, you know, we, there were 26 candidates for this presidency on an election that was just one round. So it's the first for the poll that wins. And this is an incumbent president. How do you want to contest with an incumbent president when you are 25, each one of you wanting to be the first. So the result is here, even though three or four uh, did opt to, uh, to go to the side of the, the one that was leading the opposition, uh, Katumbi, there was no way they could really compete with Tshisekedi. So the partial results that are being released, you find in some places Tshisekedi alone has 70, 80, 90 percent so there is from what has been released so far there is absolutely no way any member of the opposition can uh, compare with no they can't they can't they can't there's no much actually it looks like a, a one-man show well, on December 31st, when we're expecting the uh, results, we'll just have to wait and see how it all pans out. But in the meantime, uh, the opposition, they're also calling for the annulment of the, uh, of the election. And we've seen uh, civil society organizations also saying that, uh, well, they're citing the fact that SENI had to extend the voting days to the next day. You know, it was initially December 20, but then they had to extend to December 21st. And, you know, they say it's against the electoral law. In your opinion, what, what, what do you think about this? Mary, you know, I have, I have been monitoring elections uh, across the African continent. I know the best I've ever monitored was the one in Ghana when uh, John uh, was elected, where I saw people really confident with the system. But there were irregularities. There's no doubt about that. 
I mean, the election was supposed to have started at 6 o'clock, 6 a.m. In many places, uh, the centers were not open. That's the number one thing. The second thing is they introduced a new system where people had to choose for the president, vote for the member of the National Assembly, vote for the member of the provincial in Nigeria called the State Assembly, and then finally vote for the municipalities. Now, you had throughout the country of almost 1,000 candidates. The Independent Electoral Commission, we can, as we say in Nigeria, if they really tried to be able to print all the presidential candidates, all the, uh, the National Assembly candidates, all the provincial or state candidates, as well as the, all the municipalities. But people had to come up with those four figures, each one on his own, it was so complicated because some of those old women who were uh, mobilized couldn't know they needed the real help. So the machines, not all of them functioned as expected. People, not all, not all of them knew how to operate them. But the enthusiasm, the enthusiasm of the people to come out and vote, that was amazing. And add to it the fact that um, one of the key can, uh, of our opponents, Tyler Moïse Katumbi, was portrayed as being a foreigner and was still being uh, attached, connected to those who are exploiting mines in the eastern part and closer to Rwanda. That made most of the, the voters to just abandon him. He would have been a great challenger, but unfortunately, having appeared as a foreigner as part of those who exploited the Congo, it became very difficult for him to look at me. No, they came out calling for an armament, but, but it's normal throughout Africa, but I don't... Many people in the civil society think um, they have no case. But I also heard some of the international observers, the African Union, some of the European Union, and even uh, Carter Center, some of them said, well, there were serious irregularities, but they are not enough to render the election null. Right, That's the then. feeling I'm getting from okay. here. All right, then. Uh, thank you so much, Reverend Father Jean Ngoi. Thank you for your contributions on the program. The pleasure is mine, Mary. Thank you, and thanks to the channels. The wonderful uh, TV station. Carry on the good job. Thank you. Over in Senegal, where jailed opposition leader Osmane Sonko has submitted his candidacy to contest in the presidential elections scheduled for February next year. The submission was made to the Constitutional Council despite the state's refusal to provide him the necessary documents. Well, like other candidates, the jailed opposition leader had until December the 26th to submit his candidacy and show he has collected enough signatures. Last week, the national entity that runs elections in Senegal did not provide Mr. Sonko's representative with the documents needed to file, but his lawyers insisted he will still file, hoping the justice system would be more flexible. The 49-year-old was sentenced to two years in prison on June 1st on charges of corrupting minors and has been jailed since the end of July on other charges including calling for insurrection, conspiracy with terrorist groups and endangering state security. Well, he has always denied the charges saying they are intended to prevent him from challenging President Macky Sall in the February 25th election. With us, Burundi has held a mass funeral for victims of a deadly attack in the western region of the country. The attack, which happened in Gatumba, saw gunmen kill at least 20 people and wounded nine others near Burundi's western border with the DRC. According to the government spokesperson, among those killed in the raid included 12 children, two pregnant women and a police officer. The Red Taraba rebel group, which has been battling Burundi's government from bases in eastern Congo since 2015, claimed responsibility for the attack. The rebel group previously said it had attacked 
and destroyed equipment at the country's international airport in Bujumbura back in September, although no casualties were reported. Nigerian-based energy company Riverside LNG has announced plans to supply gas to South Africa from the first quarter of next year. The company's chief executive, David Igay, who made this known to journalists, say the move follows a gas export partnership agreement it signed earlier this year with Johannesburg, uh, with, Johann, with Johannes Schuetz Energy Import AG of Germany, as it explores potential deals on the continent. Well, this historic deal would mark the first of such agreements between the two nations while showcasing potential collaboration in the energy sector. Nigeria's LNG exports, which totaled about 14.7 million metric tons in 2022, has so far reached 12.5 million metric tons this year. Well, as Nigerians celebrate the holiday season, Channels Television took a trip to parts of Lagos metropolis where our lenses captured some of the Christmas stories. Our correspondent, Will Ebong, sat with two families, each facing the economic challenges in the country in their unique way, and they tell us how they spent Christmas. Lagos, a city of contrast, embraces the holiday season with anticipation. How are you spending Christmas? I hope you are having... Well, we embark on a journey to explore how two families from different economic backgrounds are celebrating Christmas in this dynamic metropolis. Ah, good morning. Merry Christmas. Meet the Ubeis, a family of three celebrating Christmas in their modest home in the Uwuru area of the state. Thank you. <laughs> On arrival, there was no electricity supply in the neighborhood. The purchasing power of an average Nigerian has gone down. That is us inclusive, you understand. For instance, my gin is down there, right? See us waiting here. I could not fix it for one reason or the other. For them, the cost of living crisis is real and they share how it differs from last year's. To buy tomatoes, I couldn't buy because things are very high. The price, the, to, uh, the basket of tomatoes we used to buy 1,800 is now 3,000 something. Now, the girl that we used, a, one kg that we used to buy, let me say like uh, last year, between 900, 700 is 1,100 now. There's nothing you can do. You must buy and cook. Despite it all, the Obey family appears to have found joy in caring and sharing. Oh, Merry Christmas! Please come and share with us. Hey. Ah, that's your happy Christmas. We have just visited the Ube family at Uwuru and we are going to visit the Ode family now at Medina Estate, their home. And we're going to see how they're celebrating Christmas this season. Join me. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> How are you? I'm very fine, thank you. You're welcome to the Ode family. Thank you. Um, <laughs> lovely home. Oh, thank you. The Odes, a family of three, celebrate the season with extended family, one of whom, incidentally, is one time Miss Nigeria, Anna Ode. <laughs> While they may be more economically endowed, the family, however, does not enjoy any form of immunity from the effect of the rise in cost of living. Before, we used to hire chairs, put, put out a canopy, a family and friends, you know, even passers-by, they come and um, um, they partake in all the goodies that we have to offer. But this year, it's, um, it's not been like that. This year, in, in particular, we try to do a lot of activities around Christmas, just mainly for my daughter, really. You know, so Christmas tree, getting the decorations done and all of that. Just something to give her 
you know, some memory that, okay, it's a time for celebration and a time, you know, for family and to have fun. In addition, the jackpot syndrome has also had its toll on the Christmas celebration. I guess one thing I miss from previous years that I haven't been able to do this year has been going to poorer communities and, you know, spreading the joy of Christmas, sharing food, um, clothing, and just trying to give people who are less privileged something to celebrate with. But we weren't able to do that this year, and the major reason for that is that the people whom we come together to do that with, a lot of them have left the country. In the face of economic adversity, families in Lagos may have found solace in shared moments. These intimate snapshots create a tapestry of tradition that speaks to the city's resilience and enduring spirit of Christmas. Will Ibang for Channels Television News. And finally, on the program, a fencing club in Nairobi, Kenya, is creating awareness about the sport. While the sport is not popular in some African countries, the team hopes to change the narrative by getting more support and as well as uplifting opportunities for local youths in the community. It's a busy day in one of Nairobi's eastern states. A sword-wielding group from the Savora Matani Fencing Club brings the streets of Rama to a standstill. Dressed in white, a group of fencers are competing by taking turns trying to poke or score hits on each other as residents gather to watch. Aged between 15 to 18 years, the group of two girls and six boys have been learning and practicing fencing since 2021 after they were given space for free. Even though the sport is not popular in Kenya, their aim is to make people aware of it and garner their support. This fencing student, Grace Allen, took up the sport to keep her busy and away from the streets. This sport is very unique. Many people don't know this sport, and like football, many people know it. It has helped me very much because if you look around, there are some my, my age mate girls that are pregnant. Yeah, so if you join in something, that is keeping you busy. It will help you to not get distracted with some drug abuse and so, yeah. The team's coach, Isaac Mburu, who is also a coach for the Kenyan national fencing side, started the initiative after learning the sport abroad. His aim is to keep youth off the streets and away from crime that almost ended his life. I never wanted to see any youth in the life that I lived. You understand? That's why uh, you see that we are going so hard in pulling in uh, more youths, just trying to bring them in and into this safe space, whereby we call it, because they get mentored. We really eradicate on that in paying fees, in uh, giving them the opportunity to fence. So that's how the, the fencing tourney was born, most, mostly is to give them the, the sense of belonging, the sense of um, you can come, no matter ex how expensive the sport is, we are not going to charge you anything, but we are going to give you the, the space for you to come, train, get the opportunities. For the young fencers, the ambition is clear, as they aim to become champion fencers. And that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Olandi.